Thank you very much, Ben. Um, so this this presentation was it was one that I suggested to Ben that I that I could have been on the um, Friday seminar list for, but he decided that there were more important, more interesting presentations during the semester. Um, but when one of those important, interesting presentations cancelled, then I got the I got a look in. So um, <laughs> this is the backup presentation um, for for this week, and I hope it goes well. So um, I'm going to be presenting on on one of my um, research topics, which is the energy curve. Um, it isn't my only research topic, and I was thinking of presenting some of my rock characterization work, because I think that would be interesting, but maybe that's for another another Friday seminar on another day. Um, but what I'm going to present today is um, the developments in the energy curve. So there's been a number of developments in the energy curve. We've got some net ignited funding, thanks to Seek and, and Alison in the front row. Um, and uh, I, I, I've made three recent developments um, in terms of bringing in energy cost, bringing in the um, power through ancillary equipment in the combination circuit, and um, also bringing in isolating different commodities in the energy curve. Um, so there are important, important things that I, I identified from doing a number of workshops around the world, from, and people were saying these are limitations of the energy curve, and I went, well, yes they are. I would really like to investigate them. I just need some money to be able to do that. Um, we've gotten some money, and now I'm going to put some of my ideas into into action, which is really exciting. So, um, for too long, I'll, I'll start off. So, as a background, um, one of the things that I think about and I concentrate on, or oh, that, um, there's a third in here or something. Uh, it is energy future. What, what does the future of energy actually look like um, in the world? And I, I, I see it as, um, there, there's two kind of groups of thought in terms of this. There's the, the Mad Max group, um, and there's the, um, the fusion group. This is a fusion reactor in, in, that's being built currently in um, France. And, um, the way I see this is either either energy is going to be extremely constrained um, and there's not going to be enough to go around and price is going to go through the roof um, and they're going to be expensive or energy is going to be free and ubiquitous um, and it's going to be throughout the world. And there are people in, who sit in each one of these camps and I'm sure there's people in the audience that probably sit in each one of these camps. Um, I personally, my view is that there's going to be a portion a, a time of um, of expensive constrained energy um, that will bring in the, that'll allow the cost drivers for the low cost um, long term energy futures to be developed, and over time the the cost will be driven down um, by those lower cost energy drivers. But um, I think it's important to, to understand that there are many different thoughts about what's going to happen into the future with energy cost um, and the drivers that have traditionally been around maybe aren't, aren't as predominant anymore and they're changing. Sorry, I turned that before you could take the vote. Um, so in, in line with that, um, one of the things that I've been developing is this energy curve. Um, and I've talked about these a number of times um, to this audience and to other audiences. Um, essentially what it is, um, I, I concentrated on comminution um, because comminution is the largest proponent, uh, the largest proportion of energy consumption on the mine. And what, what I did was I developed a database, um, a really in-depth database that contains a number of sites from around the world, a, a quite a large extensive database based off JK Tech's data to begin with, and then um, a whole lot of additional data that I've added to it. And uh, I decided that the best way to be able to present the variability in all these combination sites was to do a uh, cost curve type um, illustration that you can see on the board. Um, so this is how I represent the energy curve. Each bar on this curve represents an individual mine um, with the, or an individual combination circuit, really, um, with the width of that bar representing the annual production of that or annual throughput through that um, combination circuit, and the height of the bar 
representing the um, energy intensity. And I've got a number of different measures that I use to describe energy intensity. This is just one of them. This is the specific energy, um, one of the easiest to kind of comprehend. But I've got another a number of other ones that, that relate to the hardness of the ore, the the circuit efficiency, the grind size, and the grade um, of the ore. So um, the database that this is based off, um, there are obviously a lot of mines there, um, and the database contains about 40% of the material milled in um, annual material milled in gold, copper, lead, zinc, silver, nickel, and platinum production globally. Um, so it's quite a significant database and contains a lot of a lot of mines. And large portion of the mine. So, from that background, um, I might just go back to it. Um, so, one of the questions that's been asked to me well, yes, looking at it in terms of kilowatt hours per tonne is important, the energy intensity, but what about the cost intensity? What mines really care about is the cost. Um, the cost driver is what's going to be um, driving their, their, their performance for energy efficiency. Um, but I have only been able to obtain energy price from a number from a small number of mines. Um, it's commercially confidence kind of information um, that people don't like giving out freely. And um, there's large variation in those energy prices that, that mines pay. It seems to be dependent on the day, um, on the the phase of the moon, on all kinds of different things uh, influence the the energy pricing, um, and it can vary. Uh, I've been told by mines that that they think that plus minus fifteen percent of their energy price is dependent on the day that they actually sign the contract, and they sign that contract for three years. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of variability there. But um, so I couldn't. I I needed to find a way to be able to assign an energy price to all the mines that I didn't have an energy price for, um, and I came up with this methodology that I'm going to share. So this is the what I, what I did first was I went well the energy price that a mine pays is probably related to the energy price of the country that that mine is located in. Um, so I went to the World Bank and um, this is uh, a study that the World Bank did uh, on the energy price of different mines uh, of, of different countries. Sorry, and this is the distribution of energy prices across all those countries. Um, and you can see there's a wide, wide variance um, from uh, two US cents per kilowatt hour up to 50 US cents per kilowatt hour. So that's that's quite a variance across across different countries, um, which would be expected. And the average is about 15 um, cents per kilowatt hour. Um, and this fits a, a log normal distribution, just because um, I thought it would be interesting to show you that. <laughs> But the red dots there um, represent, I, I thought it would be interesting to look at um, the mining intensive countries and what their average energy pricing is. Um, and the red dots there, the red circles, represent the mining in, um, intensive energy countries. Um, and you can see that most of them sit in the, in the middle, um, in the median, or below the median, with only two that are, that are really above um, the median point. So we typically get cheap electricity in comparison to to other um, countries that aren't mining. But um, it's important to note that because of the variability in energy prices, a uh, very strict definition was required to, to collect this data. Um, and that was for a commercial warehouse um, with the, using electricity for 30 days between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. in the largest business city of the region in the month of March 2017. So um, that just the, even that definition shows you that there's a large variance depending on when you use the electricity, how much electricity you use, where you are, um, and whether you're commercial or whether you're you're um, residential. So and and I I know um, that if you look across Australia at least. The mines aren't in the major cities. <laughs> we don't like mining in our major cities. So if these, this is the distribution of, of mines, precious metal are the white dots here, um, and black are the bulk commodity mines. 
around Australia, and and lo and behold, they don't, um, they aren't positioned in the major cities. So the electricity price is going to be different from what the um, average country price is, as represented by the World Bank figures. Um, so um, what what I did was I looked at the the data that had been submitted by various mines in the database. So I do have a, a number of mines in the database have submitted their electricity prices. And what I did was I divided those electricity prices by the um, country average electricity price as given by the World Bank. Um, and you can see here that mines vary from between 30% of the country average up to almost one, one and a half times the country average. Um, and this seems to be dependent on where the mines are located predominantly, but also another number of other factors about um, when they signed their um, when they actually signed their contracts. But there, there is a there's 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 quite a distribution here, um, and it can be fitted by a trunc truncated normal distribution. Um, just for your information, um, but I thought I'd put that in there just to show you what the distribution kind of looks like. So what I did next was I thought, well, the best way to be able to represent that variability, that variability within a country, is by looking at the location of the mine. Um, and the location of the mine, not just by itself, but in relation to electricity generating assets. Um, and so, so I went looking for a database um, that contained those electricity generating assets. And I found this one um, in the Netherlands um, uh, from Delft. Um, they have quite a comprehensive database that, that's able to be accessed. It's not easy to be able to download all the data. And I've got one of my students in the room that actually helped me with this um, and put together the MATLAB code to be able to actually download this around the world. Um, so thank you for joining. Um, and this, this database contains about 90% of the world's electricity consumption. Um, and contains over 50 or about 55,000 um, generators around the world with about 20 petawatt hours um, of generation capacity. But what I realized very quickly was that if we just use the proximity to a generator, um, we would be accounting for these generators that are in the middle of Australia that obviously aren't as big as the ones that are on the, on the east coast. So we need to take into account the actual generation capacity of each individual generator, as well as the location of that generator um, in relation to, to the mine. Um, so what I did was I um, put a grid over this, um, uh, a, a latitude, longitude little grid at six different um, dimensions, so going from small to large, um, and I did a histogram, of, and I counted the the amount of electricity generation in terms of um, gigawatts in those different blocks, and then I averaged those together to be able to get the um, the reach of that um, mine of that electricity generator, and then I um, did that ten times, iterated it ten times at random different grids um, to be able to get a kind of indication of the energy density across Australia, and this is what that looked like. Um, so I call this the, the energy density. It, the units are watts per meter squared or megawatts per kilometer squared, the equivalent. Um, and you can see here that this, this makes a lot more sense to us. Knowing Australia, um, a large, oh sorry, I should say the, the yellow colors are, are high energy density um, and the dark blue colors are low energy density and you've got a range in between. So this makes sense to us as Australians. We look at this and we say, well, yes, a lot of electricity generated is down the east coast. Um, there's a little bit on the west coast. Um, and in the middle of Australia, there's very little energy generation. So um, we can do that on Australia, and it, and it makes sense. Um, and we can do that across the world, um, and it makes a lot of sense as well. And I've gotten um, my student who's from Mauritius to be able to check what the generation was in Mauritius, um, and that seemed to be reliable. And I terms of that was a good estimation for when the, the database was arrival, um, as well as some other countries. So 
Um, here you can see the energy density around the world. This is a log scale in terms of the color, because um, if you don't do a log scale, Europe and the US just come out as bright lights and everyone else is in the dark. Um, but this, this gives you an indication at least of the distribution of energy generating assets and how big they are. Um, and can, so, so this has a resolution of 0.1 degrees of latitude and longitude. Um, as I said, it's a histogram of six different mesh resolutions iterated 10 times. Um, if you want to ask me for the details of that, I can, I can tell you a bit better later. Um, and the maximum influence of an individual power plant was 666 kilometers. Now, I, I didn't choose that because I'm some kind of devil worshiper. Um, I chose that because that was the maximum distance that I was able to find a plant that was still connected to the grid. Um, so we looked at all the plants from um, Google Maps and, um, and determined whether they had they were connected to the grid or whether they, were, they had on-site generation. Um, and this is the maximum dis distance that we were able to find one that was connected to the grid. So we used that as the maximum range of, of a uh, power plant. It's also related to the, um, the ability for power to be transmitted. Um, in one of our systems. So if we, if we then overlay on top of that all of the mines in the energy curve um, database, we can get the distribution of energy density um, of those mines in the database um, around the world. And this is the, that distribution. So if we look at energy density, this is the frequency distribution and the cumulative frequency distribution of, of all the mines in the database. Um, so we can tell a lot from this. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but um, essentially the, the mines because they're not located in the major cities, they're not normally not located very close to electricity generating assets, but they're also not in the middle of nowhere, which I'm surprised about. Um, there are lots of places that have worse electricity, e energy density than the mines. So they're normally on the fringes. Um, so within um, 200, 300 kilometers of, of different generating assets. Um, but anyway, so that's, that's that. So we're able to use this distribution then to um, provide a multiplier for the mines in terms of electricity cost. So that's what we're trying to get at, electricity cost. So this is how we get there. Um, say we've got a mine in the Pilbara of Australia. Um, we move across and we're able to, because of the colour, able to work out what the energy density is in that mine. Um, move up from that energy density on the cumulative frequency graph that I've showed you just before um, to work out where it sits in terms of the database. Um, inverse that, and we can work out the, um, the price multiplier that needs to be um, multiplied by the average price in that country. Um, and this is the distribution of, of price multipliers in the energy curve database. Um, so, as, as the data had shown, between 1.5 and, and 0.2, um, most of the mines sit in that region. And if we multiply the multiplier by the average price of that country, um, we can get a distribution of the electricity prices um, of the mines in the energy curve. Now, um, this is not going to be precise. It's not going to be, well, not precise, but it might not be accurate. Um, because, but it's, it's because, because there are so many different factors that influence electricity price. But this is a way of um, assigning uh, cost variability, um, a likely variability in, in energy price that is based off just simply its location, um, the location of the mine. So um, as we get more people, and, and, and I have gotten feedback from this from mining companies that are much more um, happy to submit their electricity price based on the fact that I've done this analysis. So as that continues to snowball, um, hopefully the number of mines in the, the, we've assigned an electricity price to will reduce, and the number of mines that we know the electricity price will increase, um, and this will become more close to reality. Um, but at the moment, it at least um, presents the distribution um, quite well and variability in energy price. So here you can see the energy price varying from about three. Um, cent per kilowatt hour up to about 40. 
So once again, we've got this, this factor of 10 um, variation in energy price, which is what we would actually expect. Um, and if you multiply that by the kilowatt hours per ton, the original energy curve that I showed you, you can get the dollars per ton um, that is paid in, in terms of contribution. Uh, this distribution is obviously much wider, um, going from very low values where maybe you're just doing crushing and screening, um, up to very high values where you've got to grind very fine, as well as um, have quite a high energy price. Uh, and there's, there seems to be quite a significant uplift at this top end. Um, every 80% of the mines are under under two two dollars per ton, um, and then 20% seem to lift off up to um, ten dollars per ton from there. Um, so it's quite a quite a different type of distribution than, than I was expecting when I first started this process. And we can overlay on top of this the, the kilowatt hour per ton graph as we had um, shown earlier. Um, and now we can assess a mine in terms of its kilowatt hour per ton and its cost intensity, um, its dollar per ton value. And I'll just show you um, a case study of that now. Um, this is a case study I've been using for a little bit of time now, so a lot of you would have seen it. I presented it in the last Friday seminar that I did. Um, this is a case study that, that I partnered with Anglo Gold Ashanti to produce, um, and this is based off some discussions that I'd had with Anglo Gold Ashanti, where they had two mines, Tramalotti and Tropicana, and I was interested by the fact that one company who's developing two mines at the same time can come up with two different circuits because Tropicana decided to go for an HPGR circuit and Gramalotti decided to go with an SABC circuit, so a SAG milling circuit. Um, and I went, oh, well, that's interesting. Um, what were the drivers behind those decisions? So we looked at the pre feasibility study, um, and if you plotted the specific energy differences between the SAG milling circuit, which is the top point there, and where the ball is. Um, is the HPGR for both Gramalotti and Tropicana. There was a reduction in specific energy estimated for both of those, both of those mines, quite a, quite a significant drop in, in, in both mines. Um, the reason Gramalotti is slightly lower is not because it had less hardness, but because it needed to grind coarser. Um, so they had similar, similar competence, um, and it was just the grind side that was really the big difference between them. Um, but what happened was that when, when I started delving deeper into this, the cost drivers are very different. Gramalotti had, a, had an energy price that was one third that of Tropicana. So if you plotted that, now that we've got the energy cost curve, um, you can plot that reduction in terms of energy cost. And um, the Tropicana mine moved quite a fair way down the, the, the cost curve in terms of the vertical axis, um, but it was in a steep part of the cost curve, so it didn't move. Um, two parts of the way. But the um, Gramalotti, there was very little difference in terms of energy, uh, energy cost, so the, the dollars per ton at Gramalotti. Uh, and it, it only moved on the, on the cost curve, on the energy curve, because it was kind of a flat, flat area of the energy curve. Um, so that was kind of my reason for originally doing the, the cost curve. Uh, was to be able to display data like this, um, and I think that's a that's a success. Um, but there's another case study that I actually only completed at the end of last week, so thanks Rick for allowing me to present this. Um, but this is the complex ore bodies. Uh, Rick has been looking at a database of um, ore bodies that the complex ore bodies that um, aren't yet developed. So for various reasons, they're, they're, they aren't yet developed. And this shows those, um, those ore bodies, those various mines that could be developed but aren't. Um, here we've got the cumulative copper reserves on the, on the x-axis and the copper grade on the, the y-axis, but presented the same as an energy curve or a cost curve. Um, so these are all the mines in the database. So I said, well, um, could one of the reasons be because of the energy price? Um, and and we, we, we looked at plotting the geographical location of each one of these, these ore bodies 
on the energy curve database, on the um, energy density um, map. And these are those, those lines plotted on the energy density map. I don't know why it's kind of an orange color in the background, but I'll fix that up. Um, and here you can see each one of the lines represented by a little red triangle there. Um, and what, what can be seen is that they're, they're similar to the current mine. They're not located in the high energy density areas, typically, um, but they're also not located in the dark blue areas. Um, so they're, they're on the outskirts of, of the, um, the yellow areas, is, is how, I, uh, how I see it anyway. Um, and uh, if we, we could color each one of these bars based on its energy density from up here. So that's what, that's what this looks like. Um, so you can see here we don't have any dark blues and we don't have any bright yellows. Um, so there's, it's, it's um, and I haven't done any uh, intense um, investigation of this, but um, at least we can show that we can plot the, the energy density of each one of these mines and, and maybe see where there's a driver um, for energy at, at each one of the mines. Now, the second part of my talk, so I'll, I'll try and go through these last two quite quickly. That's the main, the main reason that I wanted to do this talk. But these are two, I've developed two new um, areas for the energy curve to be able to take into account ancillary equipment energy, which I'm going to talk about now. So that's um, conveyors and pumps, and later I'll talk about different commodities as I get the chance. Um, so one of the things that we need was identified early in the energy curve is that if we just present the um, energy consumption of the actual milling equipment, um, we bias um, our assessment um, in terms of circuits that have a lot of ancillary equipment. So the, the equipment requires a lot of conveyors and a lot of pumps um, in comparison. So. Uh, the, the case in point for that is the HPGR circuits versus the SAG circuits. So if we see, a, a, this is a typical HPGR ball milling circuit, and if you highlight where the conveyors are, um, there are a lot of conveyors in here. Um, in, in the circuit, there's a lot of conveyors, there's a lot of um, stockpiles, a lot of storage, dynamics going around the circuit. Um, I mean, it's a simplified thing, but they have to be the um, laid out over a large um, footprint because of the limitation on the um, gradient of the conveyor belt that can carry carry what up. And if you compare that with the with the SAG milling circuit, um, there's much fewer requirements for conveyors in a in a SAG milling circuit. Um, so if we don't take into account these conveyors and the pumps, um, we're going to bias our um, our assessment in terms of um, HPGRs over SACs. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll talk a bit about that now. So these are a couple of HPGR circuits that, that at least I've been to. Um, the top is, is Mikhail Koina, and then we've got Kadia, and down here is Cerevote. I haven't been to Cerevote, but it's a good case study. Mm -hmm. um, and the typical conveying power, um, and it was, it was identified by Marcos in the audience that that actually you needed to double, in some cases, the specific energy that the HPGR actually consumes um, to take into account the conveying power. Um, so if you just take into account the energy that the HPGR does, you bias your, your assessment. And um, in the, in the um, Nicole Poyner example, it's about 5.8 kilowatt hours per tonne of conveying power that's there. Um, in terms of the Cerevote, it's about 2.4 kilowatt hours per ton. Uh, and at Kaya, I've just received some the information recently that says it's a little bit below one, but that's operating rather than at the rest are installed um, conveying power. So when you take into account the installed, it's probably a lot larger than that. Um, so I know the conveying power of a number of sites. I've been submitted it. Um, or I found it in, in, in publications. But there, once again, like energy costs, there are a number of sites that I don't know the, electric, the, the energy consumption of the conveyors. So I had to go back to first principles as to what affects the conveying power. 
Um, and here we've got a number of the parameters. There's the lift, there's the length, the capacity, the velocity, the belt width, the belt height, the weight of everything, the rolling resistance, the friction between the skirt plates, and there's, there's a number of extra ones. But um, as you can probably tell, there are a number of these that would be consistent, or at least can be assumed to be um, not varying over a wide range. Um, so that we can create a simplified model based on the capacity of the belt and the distance that the belt has to, has to travel. So that was my aim. Um, and this is the results that I came up with um, using a simple um, calculator uh, and taking a lot of the parameters to be the same at, um, at different mine types and assuming um, a lot of those things. We can get a, a model here. These, these data points are at different throughputs, um, but I've normalized for the throughput through those. Um, and we can get a model for the distance that the, that the um, conveyor has to go and the specific energy requirement. Um, and here the, the um, figure is 0 0.004, that's six meters. Um, so actually it's about 0.4 kilowatt hours per ton times kilometers. Um, so we can use that figure to work out the uh, an approximation of the kilowatt hours per ton um, that the conveying consumes. And just to show that that isn't totally based on um, random numbers, uh, you sh this is the these are the conveyors at Cerro Verde, where there's some some, some nice data for the conveying power at Cerro Verde. Um, there is a bit of scatter here, um, and these are conveyors with a large amount of lift in them. Um, I haven't taken into account lift in this, this is, this is horizontal distance. Um, I've assumed an a average lift um, that those conveyors are doing. Um, but if you, you, know, you can see that there are a number that, that agree um, relatively well with, with the figures that I, that I saw. And if you look at Cerro Verde, there are 16 major conveyors, uh, 7.4 kilometers length. This is obviously an HPGR plant. Um, lots of conveying power. It's 31 megawatts of installed power, um, which equates to about 3.1 kilowatt hours per ton. Um, which, if you turn it, turn, change it in terms of per kilometer, is about 0.42 kilowatt hours per ton times kilometer, which agrees very closely with with the figure that I had. Um, so there's a bit of reality there as well. So um, what we can do is look at aerial. Um, assessment of different mines and measure their conveyors. Um, so this is a standard SABC circuit in Western Australia um, where I've just put a ruler on here um, using Google Maps, it's very easy to do. Um, you can get the distance of that conveyor from where the crusher is um, to where the sag milling is, is about 600 metres. Um, and in comparison to an HPGR circuit in South Africa that has about 3.4 kilometers of conveying belt, conveyor belts. Um, so that's where we can we can then, using our 0.4 um, kilowatt hours per ton times kilometers, we can get the kilowatt hours per ton of these different sites. Um, and before I, I show you the results of that, um, the other thing we needed to do was understand the pumping power. Um, so the pumps are obviously a, a large power consumer on, in terms of ancillary equipment. But if we look at an HPGR circuit, there's, there's the pump, the, the major pump that we're talking about, the, the cyclone feed pump. And if we talk about HPGR circuits in terms of, in comparison to SABC circuits, um, that pump is, doesn't really care whether it's an HPGR circuit or an SABC circuit. Um, it's, it's more about the recirculating load around the ball mill um, than, than anything else and the density and the height of the um, cyclone. So we did the same thing. Um, once again, uh, we looked at what, what influences the power consumption of a pump. Um, it's the height of the cyclone nest, the cyclone pressure, internal pipe diameters, pipe length, roughness, slide, velocity, density, viscosity, um, number of different factors there. So once again, you can assume a number of these um, to be constant at, at um, different different mines. Um, and yes, there's a, there's a little bit of issues there, and I want to go into more detail into this. 
Um, and so I'm going to be working with Marco Hilden in, in the next little while to be able to develop this into a more robust model. Um, but you can use Moody diagrams and, and Durant settling, um, limited set, settling velocities graphs and a number of other different pumping manual graphs. Uh, and you get a figure of about 1.6 kilowatt hours per ton, um, which is a reasonable figure for, for pumping. Um, and uh, my current use of this um, is I do a normal distribution around that, that that takes into account the data that I've already received um, to be able to get what that normal distribution should look like. And this is the um, how I've implemented it in the energy curve so far. But this um, requires more work. Um, and uh, as I said, I'll be working with Mark at Helen to be able to get a get a better um, nail down of this this pumping capacity. So if you um, add the conveying power and the pumping power to your um, specific energy curve um, that I showed earlier, we can um, get what is the difference, which and the difference is the ancillary equipment. Um, so this bottom curve is without um, the pumps and the conveyors included in the specific energy, and the one behind is with it um, included. So um, I haven't been able to produce a case study on this yet. Um, it's very new research that I've just completed, uh, but at least we've got the capability of including ancillary equipment now, which is good. So the final thing that I want to go through in the, in the last 10 minutes is commodities. So one of the early things that I realized in terms of the energy curve is we've got all these different commodities. We've got data from copper, from gold, from lead, from zinc, silver, um, platinum, all kinds of different commodities. And um, I needed to be able to, one of the outcomes from an early SEEK workshop was that we needed to be able to display energy intensity in terms of um, kilowatt hours per ounce or kilowatt hours per ton final metal consumption. But I had all these different commodities um, and I needed to be able to produce them on the, on the same graph. So one of the things I went for was um, copper equivalent uh, production. And um, the reason I did that was because it was one of the easier things to, to um, to use at the time, but I got a lot of feedback from that point that um, it's so dependent on the time that you take the um, copper prices. So I should explain what copper equivalent production is. Um, you you take your lead production, your silver production, whatever your commodity is, you, you turn it into a revenue, um, so you multiply it by the price of those commodities, um, and then you divide by the copper price which gets you an equivalent tons of copper that you would have to produce to gain the same revenue as you did from the commodities that you had. So um, it's all dependent on those prices that you choose for the various commodities. Um, so this project was to find a more fair and equitable measure um, for this. And to do that, I went to, because I was working with the copper equivalent, I started with the copper equivalent. And I started looking at the, um, the variation in price of these different commodities. I got this once again by, from the World Bank. Um, and you can see here I just highlighted copper. Um, but if you just take into account the, the, um, the copper in comparison to the other commodities, they do seem to follow similar trends, um, although over different um, levels. So where copper goes up, a number of the other commodities have gone up. Um, where copper goes down, a number of the other commodities are going down because these are um, there are global kind of factors that are influencing commodity prices in general, and they do tend to go in similar directions over short periods of time. Um, so if we just zoom in on the on the copper price, um, what I what I decided to do was I said, well, how dependent is the copper equivalent? Um, production figure on the date that you choose. Um, and what I found out that it was very dependent. But that over short periods of time, if you choose a, a, a good date, you can get good correlation between these different commodities over that short period of time. So this is from 85 to 2005. 
Um, and you can see with all these other commodities on that, um, you choose 1990 as the as the date that you um, take as the as the reference point um, to to index it. And um, when you do that, the commodities all uh, uh, fairly track each other over that over that period of time. After 2005, everything goes haywire. Um, so I couldn't I couldn't take that into account. But because the drivers for commodity prices changed in that period, um, but more recently, they, uh, commodities. Although there's a lot of a lot more um, variability or or um, term I'm looking for, they they spread apart and volatility. The word I'm looking for. Um, if you use 2013 as the date um, between 2009 and 2017 you can um, essentially account for that variability in, in a lot of the, the commodity prices based on the, the copper price. So I, I said, well, I think, I think at least if I use the 2013 um, commodity prices, uh, it should be fair and equitable across, across a number of the commodity, visual commodities in the energy curve database. Uh, but you can see, um, there's been something different that's happened to zinc recently, um, and there's been something different that's happened to iron um, recently. And we kind of understand those those drivers a little bit, you know, a bit deeper. But for most of the commodities, it's, it's fairly consistent. So by using that 2013 price, I can produce the, the copper equivalent energy curve. Um, that allows me to be able to rank different mines in terms of their kilowatt hours per um, ton copper equivalent. Uh, so this takes into account the grade of the, the deposit um, and to a certain extent the recovery. So as a case study for the use of this um, copper equivalent energy curve, this is just a case study that I've been developing recently once again with Marco but also with, with Steinert, um, looking at looking at sorting and the drivers behind sorting and the energy um, improvements that can be achieved by implementing sorting on, on a mine site. And I'll be presenting this at the MillOps conference later in the year. This is a sneak peek. Um, so here you have a sorting device. And the, the critical components here, as I, as I see them, are um, how you feed the material. So you need to be able to get a monolayer of material on the belt. Um, so uh, the belt speed needs to be fast and you need to be able to position those particles in a monolayer um, so that you can detect individual particles. Um, in this, in this, in this um, device we've got an XRT, um, but there are a number of different detection devices that you can use. Um, my analysis doesn't really care which detection device you use. Um, but and then you need to be able to use air jets or some other type of ejector um, to be able to hit the particles that you want to go into one pile and allow the other particles that you don't want to go in another pile. Um, and we can put these on separate conveyor belts. So it's, it's using the air jets to actually create the, the separation. So um, I published a paper in 2012 because I was interested in the, the drivers in, for these sorting devices in terms of different particle sizes. And to achieve a belt monolap, um, as you increase the particle size, your throughput can increase because essentially you've got more weight per particle that can fit on that belt. Um, and you can only get a certain proportion of coverage on that belt. Um, so as you increase your size that you're doing the sorting, you can get a higher throughput. Um, but those coarser particles have worse gang liberation. Once again, this is with Marco that I've done this work, um, that shows that when you get coarser, your gang liberation is, is, is worse than, than when you get finer. As we all know, as you, get fine, as you grind the particles finer, your liberation improves. And so the same with valuable liberation, it's the same with gang liberation. Um, it improves as you get finer. Um, but one of the really interesting points that I think those two are fairly easy to understand is, is that as you get finer particles, your amount of air that's required to eject um, a ton of those particles goes through the roof. Um, so as you get finer, you need to do more um, little air jets that 
um, and um, to be able to eject a ton of that rock. Um, so you use, consume a lot more air. Um, and the compressor, as you increase the amount of air that you use, the kilowatt hours per ton or kilowatts of the compressor have to go up. So essentially you're using much more energy um, with the finer particles that you look at. So in that paper, um, this is the outcome of that paper, um, was that the power savings that you're able to achieve if you take into account all these factors um, increase as you increase the, the particle size that you're able to actually, that, that, that you do the ejection, that you do the sorting on. So um, that was important. Uh, but with Simon, we had a case study. I was able to get some real data. So that was all kind of um, first principles calculations. But um, recently, Steinet has helped me out to get to get some real data of a site that has employed sorting at, at their site. And, and I plotted these on the energy curve. So this is the base case of that site um, before, prior to sorting. Um, and if you just take into account the comminution energy that's saved from that sorter. So you save comminution energy by um, taking out the gain before you actually do the, the comminution. Um, and so if you take that into account, the amount of energy reduction at the specific market site was large. Um, they were able to remove a large portion of their, their sample that was gained at those sizes um, and not pass that through the comminution circuit. But what was interesting is if you take into account the energy used by the actual sorter in terms of the air jets, so you look at the net, um, that is eroded, um, that energy savings is eroded. Um, and if you split that into course and time, you can see the course um, used less energy, as I had said previously, when you move course, you use less air ejection, and the fine actually uses, if you put in the sword, it actually uses more than the base case um, in terms of net energy consumption. Um, so this is, for me, it was a very interesting outcome, something that I'd, I'd been um, thinking about for a while. Um, and it shows that sorting um, from an energy perspective can improve energy consumption, um, specifically if you do it at a course size, um, but there are other drivers for sorting, not just energy. Um, and the ability to be able to split your, your um, sample and do different processing routes on different samples, um, your ability to uh, defer um, your waste or, or low grade ore to a later point in your life, um, life of mine, um, can have great financial implications um, in terms of FPP. So there are other factors involved here and maybe energy isn't the, the largest driver um, when, we look at, when we look at sorting, but it is a driver of course, um, but that was an interesting case study. Um, but finally what I wanted to do was um, isolate different commodities uh, in terms of um, the, whether we looked at copper, whether we looked at gold, whether we looked at um, lead, zinc, silver. I wanted to isolate those curves as different energy curves. Um, but if I just presented the platinum mines, for instance, I don't have many, I maybe got six to 10 um, platinum mines. And so if I put just the platinum mines as individual little rectangles as I had in my energy curve, someone would be able to come along and go, I know what that one is. Um, probably Neville <laughs> would be able to go, I know what that one is and I know what that one is and um, be able to back calculate the confidential information that I'd be submitted. Um, so I couldn't do that. So one of the things I wanted to do was to be able to represent the distribution of those mines um, without showing the individual mines. Um, and the way I did that, determined to do that, was I fitted a, a model to each one of the distributions. Um, and Dion's not going to be happy, but once again, I used the log normal model um, to be able to fit this. It was in, important to be able to uh, show the distribution, and it fitted this distribution well, um, these distributions well. Um, and I could use it to be able to um, show the distribution of the, of the different commodities um, over each other. So that's what this looks like. Um, here's the 
the com uh, copper equivalent energy curve down below um, with the blue um, bars, the standard way of producing it. Um, and then I've got the different commodities as different